I met him when I was 18. And I began in the, the year 1834, I began analysis with him. We went out there to the tower and uh, out of the bushes suddenly we were standing around kind of, you know, awkwardly as one does, <laughs> not knowing <laughs> what was going to happen. And then out of the bushes came a man and I was deeply impressed by him. I thought he, naturally he was a Methuselah because I, when you are 18 you think a 58-year-old is, a, is a <laughs> ready for the cemetery. He told that story, which you can read in the memories, about this girl who was on the moon and had to fight the demon, and the black demon got her. And he pretended, he, or he told it in a way, as if he, she really had been on the moon, and it had happened. And I was very rationalistically trained from school, so I... I said indignantly, but she imagined to be on the moon, or she dreamt it, but she wasn't on the moon. And he, s he looked at me earnestly and said, yes, she was on the moon. I still remember looking over the lake there and thinking, and either this man is crazy or I am too stupid to understand what he means. And then suddenly it dawned on me, he means that what happens psychically is the real reality. And the, this other moon, this stony desert which goes round the earth, that's illusion or that's only pseudo-reality. And that hit me tremendously deeply. When I crawled rather drunk into bed because he gave us a lot of burgundy, that evening I thought it'll take you 10 years to digest what you experience today. Both Jung and I minded most of all about wholeness, about becoming whole, and that I got at it through my art by always trying to draw paintings that looked whole, animals, primitives, anything, anything that seemed still at one with itself and whole. And he got at it by studying the things that were wrong with people and then realizing the way to, cure, to get it right was to find their wholeness, to find the opposite to the thing that was destroying them so heavily. And of course I went through uh, tremendous encounter with the unconscious one always does in an analysis, particularly with him, he didn't let you pick flowers by the way, sort of. <laughs> when you met him in the club or when you met him privately or in the analysis, it, it was always a man interested in the I would like to use the word in this supernatural food, uh -huh. always, yeah. into the depths. And you see, you could come into his room in analysis, and he was just speaking about the dreams you had had before, last night, not knowing them, but he was, he was involved. He was so transparent for people. And that was a fascinating thing in the relationship with Jung. Oh. Uh, therefore, everybody who knew Jung had the feeling uh, he speaks one's own language. We started talking, and I went home with him afterwards. And uh, to Mrs. Jung's despair, we sat talking until about 3 o'clock in the morning without break. And again, it was ex uh, I had this very strange feeling, although it was snowing outside bitterly cold, that I was sitting round uh, one of the first fires in a camp somewhere in the bush in Africa, talking, as you can only talk in those conditions. And I said to him, why don't you come back to Africa with me? He said, you know, when I came back from Mount Elgin and from Kenya and living amongst the witch doctors of Africa, he said, I found so much witchcraft in Switzerland 
I felt that I had to deal with all this witchcraft first before I could, um, you know, before I could travel again. And he used to refer to himself uh, as an old witch doctor. Very often when people asked him, are you a Protestant, are you a Catholic? He said, don't ask me these questions. He said, you know, I'm only an old African who finds his God in his dreams. And he really meant that. He really meant that. We had this tremendous uh, human, almost animal warmth and immediacy. It was the immediacy of the laugh that got one. Uh, Schopenhauer said that humor was the only divine quality of man. Hmm. And that Basel helped him with a lot. Basel, the Baslers have an extraordinary sense of humor. And their carnival is really marvelous. Jung uh, took you there once to the Yes, he did. A lot of us, we went there the night before and got up at four o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, I think, to see the so-called Morgan strike. And the procession comes through with lights. It's most impressive. This feeling that he had that if man lived his life religiously, if he lived his life symbolically, then it, all, it was almost as if what the theologians called God and my Zulus called Mkulu Mkulu, the first spirit, where the first spirit had passed over some of his power and some of his responsibilities to the human being and that the human being had a god-like task to perform in creation and the extent to which he performed it he derived his meaning it's a very important part of Jung's thinking Well, I just paid a visit to him in Vienna, and, and then we talked for uh, 13 hours without interruption. 13 hours for without 13 interruption. 13 hours without interruption. We didn't, we didn't realize that we were almost dead at the end of it, but it was tremendously interesting. He was uh, the old man and had a great experience, and he was, of course, way ahead of me, and so I settled down to learn something first. Uh, 
I have written that book that cost me my friendship with Freud because he wouldn't accept it. Yes. Uh, he, he, to him, the unconscious was a, a, a product of consciousness. Yes. Uh, and it simply contained the remnants. I mean, it was a sort of, of a storeroom where all the discarded things of consciousness were, were heaped up and left. And, but to, to me, the unconscious then was already a, a matrix, a, a sort of a basis of consciousness of a creative nature, namely capable of autonomous acts. Uh, autonomous intrusions into yes. consciousness. Man's soul is, is a complicated thing and it, it takes sometimes half a lifetime to get somewhere uh, in one's psychological development. You know, it is by no means always a matter of uh, psychotherapy or treatment of neurosis. It, it, it is all psychology has also the aspect of a uh, pedagogical method in, in the widest sense of the, of, of the word. Um, it is something... An education. It is an education. It is something like antique philosophy and not uh, uh, what we understand by a technique. It, it is something that touches upon the whole of man and which challenges also the whole of man in the patient or uh, whatever uh, the receiving part is, as well as in the doctor. One of the tremendous uh, things which Jung did was to always emphasize the aspect of man's totality. And our totality is not complete unless we take our human failings into it. It doesn't mean that I necessarily have always to live my human failings. I obviously may have to take responsibility for them. But they are not only part of me, but they are part of every human being. That is to say, it is part of man. Consciousness is one factor, and there is another factor, equally important, that is the unconscious that can uh, <coughs> uh, interfere with consciousness any time it pleases. And of course, I, I, I say to myself now, uh, this is very uncomfortable uh, because uh, I think I am the only master in my house, but I, uh, I must have, uh, admit that there is uh, another somebody in that house that can uh, play tricks. And I had to deal with the unfortunate victims of that interference every day in my patients. Analysis, proper analysis, particularly human analysis, begins and ends with conscience. That is, that you take responsibility, that you take into consideration uh, uh, all those manifestations which so far have remained in the unconscious. In other words, you, you are not conscious of. And uh, if you start uh, taking the responsibility for those manifestations, like shadow qualities and whatnot, mm -hmm. then this is a very strong test for your conscience, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you have to, to it, only have to think of the beginning of, of psychoanalysis. I mean, it, it, took an enormous amount of moral courage to face these facts, which so far have not been considered or repressed. I thought that Jung should tell me what I should do 
whether I should write a book, whether I should uh, get a divorce, what I should do. And he wouldn't. And so I got mad at him. And uh, I uh, said, why is everybody so mean to me? And he said, why are you so mean to everybody? So I stormed out. And uh, you got what I said there. I said to him, why is everybody so mean to me? And he said, why are you so mean to everybody? That was the trigger point. I was gone for a year. And I wrote him, oh, I don't know. Every now and then I'd sit down at the typewriter and write him what a son of a bitch I thought he was. And how when I first got to Europe, Europe, everyone thought he was a charlatan. I thought he was too. And uh, uh, I didn't, uh, he was the most conceited, vain man. And, and uh, I, you know, I really had a great time. And, um, and you sent all these letters? Sent the letters. Of course I did. And I thought, I hope he drops dead of a stroke. And uh, I felt very good. I didn't, <laughs> I just felt fine. When I can get mad, my, I, I can lose five pounds just by getting mad. It's <laughs> just the adrenaline goes, and I just think, you know, it's the opposite of poor little me. And it's, I don't care. They let the world go and stuff it up. I don't care what happens to you. And, um, and one morning I woke up and I began to laugh. I thought, for God's sake, what's been going on here? What a jackass you. And suddenly I realized, surely he really hit it. And so I phoned Miss Schmidt, Fraulein Schmidt, and asked if I could have an appointment. And she laughed and said, oh, yes, she said, Professor Jung told me to save some time for you. He thought you'd be calling shortly. And sometimes you be quite unfair to one. And you think, you, you tell me, at the club, for instance, you go and something be horrid to people. And then you go home saying, now, wasn't that nasty of me? I really spoilt their weekend and saw shows on Saturday evenings. But when they next came to analysis, she found that that particular nastiness was exactly what they wanted, what they needed. I really got more from Jung when he hit me over the head than the other guy. <laughs> I don't mean literally. <laughs> he had very small eyes, and when he looked through those little eyes, or usually over the top of his uh, uh, eyeglasses, uh, you knew that he was looking at something that, that you couldn't see. And uh, what came out was usually some very simple uh, fact. It wasn't uh, any uh, aura or any great uh, message that came back from the beyond. It was uh, something about uh, your ordinary life or the ordinary situation. Now, I described a party where I felt the shadow got loose with Jung at the center of, of it where they threw a, a knotted uh, towel from one person to another around a circle. Jung kept this thing going beyond, almost beyond endurance. And uh, I fell down and broke my glasses and somebody else uh, skinned a knee. And at the end of the party, we were all in shambles. But uh, this was characteristic of Jung's intolerance of persona. It was, he was so afraid that the party would uh, stick on a polite persona level that he engineered it to bring out the shadow. And in the end, we all had a marvelous time. We all got drunk, and it was, uh, it, it ended very happily. <clears throat> he became a human being, uh, and a total one. I mean, he included everything. <laughs> He, he could be terrible. <laughs> he could be terrible. He could be absolutely terrible. Oh, in these ways. Ah, ah, yeah. In these ways. I remember one, one thing when we, we sailed on the, on the lake up there, bowling, you know, in his boat, and, uh, and there was a car, the, the wind died down completely. And we were way up from, from the turm, you know. I see, yes. Way up, and, uh, and so there was nothing else but to row. Mm. And I was an old uh, sailor, and, and, and you know, I, I, I knew how to row, indeed, better than he did, as a matter of fact. And old young. So yeah. I went and rowed, and he started criticizing me for 
every single part of a movement I made with those <laughs> rows, <you know. laughs> And he knew it better, of course. Oh, and, and didn't he, he row himself? Uh, 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 Joel was in the boat as well, my wife, and so uh, it was absolutely, it was hell. It was real hell. Until I said, good, fine, do it yourself. Yes, but <laughs> you finally down. said. <laughs> <laughs> and he did it? Yes, he had to. He had to, if you gave it. He yes, had to. Yes. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make one single move. Yes, so. And did he ever apologize? For no, no? Never. Really? Oh, he could be terrible. Oh, he could be really bad. When I was his secretary, he grumbled at me in a very loud voice. And he was, uh, he didn't like when I took it personally. So I took it. And uh, sooner or later, there was a big and very beautiful, as do we, how do you say, balloon or recompense, a compensation. Uh -huh. He compensated it. He knew exactly what he had done. And then he, one, one was um, rewarded, <laughs> if one could. If one could stand it, and if one didn't uh, uh, took it personally. You okay. see, he was so burdened by his ideas and by, um, by people outside and his inner figures. So he, I understood it quite well. He had to have a um, uh, let out, besides ventil. Uh -huh. Ventilate. And uh -huh. vent out. The steam has to go out. <laughs> yes. And it sometimes came out on you yes. when you were there. Yes, uh -huh. why not? Yeah. The personal shadow is the personal shortcomings of uh, things which every human being could be conscious of, which is not archetypal. For instance, such things as greed for money or jealousy, inferiorities which everybody has, but uh, prefers not to know about. If one is jealous or if one is suddenly possessed by wanting money or so on, one, well, one could know about it if one is honest with oneself. But the collective shadow has to do with the dark side of the archetype of the self. That means it's the shadow of the God image. In the Christian tradition, it would be the devil. And that has always been personified and felt as something which has not to do with directly with the human being. I mean, if somebody is possessed by the devil, he's much worse than just, he's not human, he, it's demonic. And, uh, but on the other hand, generally that merges. First you have this area of uh, dim, dark side, and behind it lurks the other. I've, for instance, seen that when Germany went to the devil in na Nazism, people fell into it through their personal shadow. For instance, they didn't want to lose their job because they were clinging to money. That was their personal shadow. But then they joined in with the Nazi movement for that reason and did much worse things than they would have done normally under normal social conditions. So you can say the personal shadow is the bridge to the collective shadow, or the open door to the collective shadow. But the collective shadow comes up in those terrible mass psychoses. It's like if you have your, a room and there's one door not shut, and there the devil can come in. And if you know your personal shadow, you can shut all the doors. I think that it's quite a, an important fact, historically, that there were very few of us that um, 
intentionally became analysts. What happened was that we were all, we all had neuroses and we were nice, fat, juicy ones and we were vibrating like an Aeolian harp in a high wind. And uh, uh, very often this was exacerbated by a, a marriage relationship. And so that most of us of my generation didn't prepare to be an analyst, but we went to an analyst so that he could tinker with our psyches. And somewhere along the line, we'd say, wouldn't it be peachy if I could be one of those two? I have to remember our first appointment, because Joe and I went together, and he talked right over the top of my head to Joe, arranging my appointments. And I finally said, well, where do I come in? And he said, oh, that comes later. And uh, I, I'll never forget that. Jane and I arrived in, in Zurich in 1932. We had a very deep bond between the two of us, but we also were very dissimilar. And so um, we got into horrendous clashes and crashes. We uh, just were anxious to get a hold of something that would give us some tools to work with so that we could uh, resolve these clashes. I was not so enamored of him at first. I didn't, I thought, uh, the way he talked, oh, no, it was his writing. Of course, it was very intuitive writing. And it wasn't my dish. And uh, I kept thinking, who the hell does he think he is? You know, how does he, uh, how do you know what he's saying? I mean, how does, how does he know what he's saying is, is right? And uh, I was really very resistant. It is almost the rule but I don't want to make too many rules with you <laughs> in order not to be schematic. Yes. Uh, that um, an introvert marries an extrovert for compensation or another type marries the counter type to, to complement himself. I thought, well, he's just talking through his hat and I just can't go for that stuff until I got in trouble and had him head on and then, my God, he just made all kinds of sense. I liked his opening comment. He said, uh, oh, so you're in the soup, too. <laughs> I like the two. <laughs> you could be in it together. Yeah. <laughs> the archetype is a force. It has an autonomy. It can suddenly seize you. It yes. is like a seizure. Yes. So, for instance, falling in love at first sight, yes. that is such a case. You see, you have a certain image in yourself, without knowing it, of the woman, of the woman. Yes. Now you see that girl, or at least a good imitation of your type. And instantly, you get a seizure, and you're, you're gone. And afterwards, you may discover that it was a hell of a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> or, you see, a man is quite capable He's intelligent enough to see that that woman of his choice, as one says, not no choice, he has been captured. Yeah. You know, he sees that he, she is no good at all, yeah. that she is a hell of a business. And, and he, he tells me so, and he said, for God's sake, doctor, help me to get rid of that woman. <laughs> he can't. He's, he, he's like clay in her fingers. And that is the archetype. That is so called archetype of the anima. Yes, yes. He, he thinks it is all his soul, you know. Uh, like the girls, you know, when, when a man sings very high, yes. then he thinks he must have a very wonderful spiritual character because he can sing the high C. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and, and she's badly disappointed when she marries at that particular number. Yes. Well, that is the archetype of the animus. Yeah. This is built right into the center of, of Jung's whole, uh, whole psychology that one should uh, develop one's contrasexual components, uh, as Margaret Mead so quaintly phrases it. Um, but Jung prefers to talk about the animus and the anima, meaning the feminine side of the, of the masculine side of the woman and the feminine side of the man. And so that all of us who are, are really committed and involved in the, in the Jungian uh, world are very busy trying to develop our animuses or our animas and we don't ever expect that it's going to be quite a dead heat 
and that our voices will alternate from soprano to basso, uh, or that we are going to get a reissue uh, of our vital parts. But on the other hand, uh, we do feel that um, usually going on a two-step operation, first with the projection of one's anima or one's animus, and then the gradual uh, peeling of it off and, and re-taking uh, it back in again and, and assimilating it and hopefully integrating it into one's consciousness, that this, this androgynous or almost androgynous state of being is the way one hopes to be before they throw the switch. In the beginning stages of a relationship, there's generally a lot of projection mixed up with it. And that uh, is responsible for all those love quarrels. I mean, she makes demands which he can't fulfill, and he makes demands she can't fulfill, and animus anima uh, crossing the swords. And I mean, if you tape record a love quarrel, it's the same all over the world literally and and that is projection and if people don't run away but work it out and take back all what is projection in it then appears or is peeled out of all this the true relationship now it might be none and then it would be like the Freudian thing, goodbye, and uh, now I see you simply represented that and that in me, and thank you very much, goodbye. Or there might be a tremendous amount of relationship, true relationship built up, which is not the same thing as projection. The, the intensity of our struggle uh, uh, suddenly became clear to me that Jane was, had a thinking function developed, and I had a developed feeling function. And of course, that was upside down. Uh, everybody knows that men think and women feel, only what didn't happen to be so with us. But uh, I think that his, what he did for women came through his tremendous interest in the individual. And women could be individuals too. And this problem of what is feminine and what is masculine and so forth and so on almost uh, came as second to that. Mm -hmm. So I think in a sense, and then of course his discovery of the animus and the anima, that did a lot. Jung was not apt to be a father, father figure. He was in an astonishing way near to you. Mm. Natural. He could sit down, and after 10 seconds, you failed to speak with a brother, mm. not with a father. Mm. And if you have had this brother relationship to him, <coughs> where you discussed in a free way, where you accepted that he got angry, where you also were ready to get angry at him, as men do in mm. an upright, clear way, it was easy to get along with him. But the moment where one thought that he was a father figure, mm. he was for men very destructive. Because he was too irrational to be given guidance as a father. He changed too openly, too often his mind mm. to give such a guidance. That's a natural thing to change one's mind. Mm -hmm. But a normal thing. But uh, a father should give a certain guidance. And he had no intention at all to give a guidance. So for men, it was often difficult because the moment uh, men look, and many men look for a father, mm -hmm. for a father, whereas with women it went along very much better because uh, a woman doesn't look so much for a father. She looks for a lover. Mm -hmm. And he was charming, seducing, and uh, there he offered uh, transference, often a little bit too much, ah. but with a great healing power, with a great healing power. Well, what about the atmosphere in Zurich at that time? Uh, well, that's what put me off. Oh, the cultism was just 
reeking. It was just awful. That was, there were the transferences. And I swore I would never get a transference. That, <laughs> I, that one thing I decided right away because it just looked too awful. I mean, these people were just goofy. And, uh, but I got a transference. It couldn't help it. it. Couldn't help it. Uh, I mean, after all, you get a transference because what's missing in you has got to be seen in somebody else. And there was plenty of missing in me, you know, and with, a, with a man of, of Jung's caliber. There's a lot missing. It is a regular uh, observation that when you talk to an individual and this individual gives you um, insight into its uh, inner preoccupations, interests, emotions, in other words, uh, hands over uh, his uh, personal complexes, then you get slowly and nilly-willy into the situation of a, of a sort of authority, yes. uh, uh, a point of, you become a point of reference. Uh, you know you are in possession of all the important items in a in a person's development. Now you see, that creates an emotional relationship to the analyst. And that is what Freud called the transference. Yes. Which is a, a central problem of um, of analytic psychology. It is just so as if these people had handed out the, uh, their uh, whole existence. And uh, that can have very peculiar effects upon the individual. E either they hate you for it or they love you for it, yes. uh, but you are not indifferent to them. But I, I, I never felt as though I had too much transference. It didn't last too long because Jung, uh, the one nice thing about, or the good thing about him, was he gave so much of himself. He just gave you everything he had. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as though you had a hangover. You got it all, you know? I never felt in awe of him. I just thought sometimes he was funny. When, when uh, we used to have a little argument about God, he said, oh, you know, I, I'm not so sure about God. I'm perfectly willing if he shows up, fine. I used to say to you, of course, if he shows up, he probably looks like you. And, uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I guess that uh, I thought before I got mad at him, I thought that he would have a, some kind of a solution to life's problems. Then I found I had to find the solution myself, which I suppose is, was what he did, mm. brings you to that point. We didn't know whether we were uh, fish, fle flesh, or fowl, and uh, we had to uh, find ourselves anew. I dreamt that Jung was a, a uh, Protestant clergyman standing uh, the pulpit, giving a sermon, and uh, we were all in the pews, and when he finished his sermon, uh, all the others got up and uh, began to chant mandala, mandala, the way they might in Christian uh, times have said hosanna, and uh, this represented a worshipful attitude to Jung that uh, was laughable, as you can imagine, so I thought, I hate to tell Jung this dream, but I did. And he said, well, of course you should feel that way. I was simply projecting my own Protestant background, uh, making Jung a father figure, making the other people into a group, which they were not. 
Freud always wanted to break a, a transference and to uh, resolve it. To resolve it and to bring people to life again, down to the adaptation to life again. Mm -hmm. But Jung had another point of view, had the feeling as long as we have a strong transference, one must serve it because he said there is a greater personality involved mm -hmm. in transference. And we don't know what this greater personality has in storage. And so we must serve it. And that was tremendously difficult for Jung. He often told us, you see, we should ha I should have 10 lives in order really to, to, to follow the development of, of the integration process so deeply as he did with us all. Yes. But that was also what interested him. He many times said, without you women, I couldn't have developed my psychology. I had a, a case that was a, an intelligent uh, uh, young woman. She was a, a student of philosophy, very good mind, where one could expect easily that she would see that I am not the, the, the parental authority. But she was actually unable to, uh, to get out of this delusion. Uh, and in such in such a case, one, uh, one always has recourse to the dreams. One, it is just as if one would ask the unconscious, now what do you say to such a condition? You see, she says of the unconscious, of course I know you are not my father, but I just feel like that, it is like that, it, it, I depend upon you. And, uh, and I say, now we will see what the unconscious says. Now the unconscious produced dreams in which I really assumed a very curious role. You know, uh, she was the little infant, she was sitting on my knees, I held her in my arms, I was a very tender father to the little girl, you know, and, uh, uh, and more and more her dreams became emphatic in that respect, namely that I was a, a sort of child and uh, and she is a very little, frail human uh, thing, you know, and uh, a, quite a little girl in the hands of an enormous being. Uh, and the last dream of that series was, I cannot tell you all the dreams, yeah. was that I uh, was out in nature. I stood in a field of wheat, an enormous field of wheat that was ripe for house. And I was a child, and I held her in my arm like a baby. And the wind was blowing over that field of wheat. Now you know when the wind is blowing over wheat field, these waves in the wheat field. Yes, yes. And with these waves, I swayed like that, uh, putting her as if it were to sleep, you know. And she, feel, she felt uh, as being in the arms of a of, a God, of, of, of the Godhead. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I thought, no, now, now the, the harvest is ripe. Yes. And I must tell her. And I told her, you see, what you want and what you project into me, because you are not conscious of it, is you, you have the idea of a deity. You don't possess. Therefore, you see it in me. Yes. Uh, that clicked. She certainly became aware of an entirely heathenish uh, image yes. uh, that comes fresh from the archetype. She had not the idea of a Christian God uh, or of a uh, Old Testament Yahweh. Uh, it was a heathenish God, you see, a, a, a God of nature, of vegetation, he was the wheat himself, he is the spirit of the wheat, uh, the spirit of the wind. And she was in the arms of that Newman. No. Now, that is the living experience of an archetype. Now, that made a tremendous impression upon that girl. And instantly, it clicked. She saw what she really was missing, that missing value, that, that was was 
in the form of a protection in myself and made myself indispensable to her. Yes. And then she saw it is not indispensable because it is as the dream says, she is in the arms of uh, that uh, archetypal yes. uh, idea. Now that is a luminous experience, you see. And, and that is the thing that uh, people are looking for. Yes. The, an archetypal experience that gives them uh, uh, an incorruptible value. You see, they depend upon other conditions, they depend upon desi their desires, their ambitions, uh, depend upon other people, because they have no value in themselves, they have nothing in themselves, they are only rational, and, and, and they are not in the possession of a treasure that would make them independent. But when that girl can hold that uh, experience, then she doesn't depend anymore. She cannot depend anymore because that value is in herself. And, and uh, that is a sort of liberation. Yeah. And that is, of course, uh, makes her complete, you know. Uh, in as much as she can realize such a numerous experience, she is able to continue her path, her way, her individuation. The acorn can become an oak uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a donkey. If you have a relationship to St. Jung, then you have to work on it, and the meaning is a result, perhaps, you see. Well, I can say I projected on him a father, but I also projected on him a mother, you see. And uh, the one who accepted me, I could say. And from this, in the, in the course of the years, I found a place in this world. In, I found a place in myself and in the world.